Welcome back to the Golden Age of Radio Theater on WDIR Windsor, Detroit Internet Radio, local, cross border, and worldwide. And let's get back to Blackstone Magic Detective from July 15th, 1948, The Riddle of the Talking Skull. Well, Rhoda, ready for another try? I certainly am. I'll turn my back and you can start. All right. Go. 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 Stop. Right here, Rhoda. I'm pointing to the hat. Well, that's what I was thinking of, all right. Now, Blackstone, can't you ever miss? Not with this trick, and I'll show you why. You see, I point to any object the first two times I say go. But the third time, I point to the hat. Why the hat? Because it has three letters, Rhoda. So when you were spelling hat, your count ended with mine. Well, well, that's right. So it did. And for the fourth letter, I point to the book. Because there are four letters in the word book. But you hit that one, too. And I can hit all the rest of them. After book comes watch with five letters. Then pencil with six. And ashtray with seven. Then lipstick with eight and cigarette with nine. You can't miss when you choose objects with a different number of letters. Hat, book, watch. Yeah, but suppose nobody has a watch. Then use a clock or a knife instead. Anything with five letters. And for eight letters, you could, well, you could use a magazine instead of a lipstick. That's right. For that matter, you can leave an object out and just touch anything on that number because it won't count. But there's one thing you must be careful about. Never to have two objects with the same number of letters. That's right. Make sure they're all different. And keep count of the letters in each word. You will always end on the chosen object. I hope, ladies and gentlemen, you enjoy that trick. And now, until next time, this is Blackstone saying good magic and goodbye. Washing machine dealer in Jamestown is the Jim Peters Company, located in the Hotel Jamestown building. Be with us next time when the world's greatest magician, Blackstone, tells us the story of the Whispering Buddha and explains more tricks that you yourself can perform. Listen in again to Blackstone, the world's greatest living magician. Okay, that was great fun there. So uh, our next episode here is from 1935, and the show was called The Origin of Superstitions. This episode is called Throwing Salt Over One's Shoulder. Superstition on the air. you do, ladies and gentlemen. Here is another short, short story in the series designed to disclose the origin of popular superstitions. This one deals with the belief that throwing salt over your shoulder will counteract the supposed ill luck caused by the accidental spilling of salt. serve good food on this train, don't they? Fine. Will you pass me the salt? Here you are. Thanks. Doggone it, I dropped it. 
What of it? There's no harm done. I know, but uh, what on earth are you doing? Why, I'm throwing some of it over my left shoulder. <laughs> Look out, boss. You almost got me in the eye. I'm sorry, old timer. Oh, that's all right, boss. But that time when they try to keep bad luck away, you almost handed it to me. <laughs> Do you believe in that silly salt superstition, George? Why, not exactly, but I never take any chances. Do you know why you throw the salt over your shoulder? I haven't the slightest idea. Have you? Why, I know all about it. I'd like to hear the story. I've been throwing salt over my shoulder for years, but never took the bother of finding out why. It's a funny coincidence you're throwing that salt almost in the waiter's eye. How so? It was the throwing of salt into a man's eyes thousands of years ago on a desert in Babylonia that started that superstition. That is most interesting. Salt was originally regarded as a gift of the gods, a sort of divine substance. During the Roman era, the soldiers and laborers received their pay in salt. From their word, salarium, meaning money paid for services rendered, we derive our exceedingly pleasant word, salary. Now you're talking my language. Is that how the expression worth his salt originated? Exactly. Salt was the first thing offered to a guest to cement friendship. The guest would partake of it to demonstrate his friendly feeling toward his host. If by any chance he dropped some of it on the ground, that automatically offended the gods and brought their vengeance down upon himself. Is that clear? Perfectly. As our story starts, a merchant named Kalki of Sippa is returning with his donkey caravan from Babylon. The scene opens in the tent of Kalki, though neither he nor his chief attendant Lazma is present. Instead, we find a traitor, one of Kalki's entourage, plotting Kalki's destruction with a desert nomad whom he has smuggled into the tent. You are certain Kalki will come in here? I am positive. This is his tent. Will he be alone? I believe so. He must be alone, or I shall not be able to kill him. If someone is with him, wait until they go. I cannot tarry too long. Each minute I stay here, it becomes more dangerous. I shall arrange that he be alone. But suppose that his friend should be with if him. If Lasmar be with him, I shall call him aside. That will give you your chance. Where shall I hide? There, behind that bale of rugs. Is your knife sharp? My knife is always sharp. See that your wits are the same. My wits are sharper than your knife. Mm, all will be well. It must be well. Too many times have things happened on this journey, and he still lives. Am I to blame? Why did the attack fail last night? My tribesmen turned cowards and ran away when Kalki's slaves put up a resistance. Can I help that? Ah, all of your tribesmen are cowards. Careful. My knife knows no favorites. It is as sharp for you as for Kalki. You would not dare kill me. Without my aid, how could you escape from the camp? I would fight my way out. Last night, you and your friends could not fight your way in. Have a care, my friend, lest you go too far. Let us not quarrel. Hurry, then. I must return to my people, lest they become restless. Remember our pact? One half of everything to me. The other half you divide with your companions as you see fit. Why must you get half? Because without me, you can do nothing. So be it then. But mind you, there must be no mistake tonight. Where are your companions? Nearby, waiting for my signal. Good. Everyone in camp is tired. They are worn out from the fight last night and the hurried march today. That I know. There are only two men to fear. Kalki and Lasma. That too I know. Then hide you behind the rugs. If Kalki comes in alone, do not touch him until I signal. Why must I wait? Kalki must not be killed until I have gone with Lasmar down to the donkeys. Then will I signal you. You come from behind the bales. Stab Kalki quickly and quietly. Then you come and help me slay Lasmar. Can you not do it alone? Lasmar is big and powerful, and I am not used to such work. You are carrion. You're brave only after the kill. You and I must not quarrel. You said it yourself. Go on with your planning. You help me with Lasmar. Then you can give the signal to your companions. With both Kalki and Lasmar dead, the slaves will put up no resistance. Tis well. But 
How do I know that after Kalki and Lasmar have been slain, you will not do away with me and keep the whole of the spoils without sharing? You and I have shared salt together. And even to a traitor such as you, I keep the pledge of salt. To kill Kalki, with whom I have not shared salt, is one thing. But everlasting vengeance would fall upon me and mine if I touched you. I trust you. You know what to do? What shall the signal be? Twice will I whistle like this. When you hear the second whistle, strike and strike surely. Fear not. Once will be sufficient. All that I need is... I shall be glad when this trip is ended. I too. Quiet. He's coming now. Get behind the rugs. Ill luck has followed in my footsteps since the day I left Sipper. So it seems. The finest of cloths I brought to Babylon, were they not? The very best. And yet no one would buy. The finest rugs did I bring, and no one wanted them. It is true. The finest spices I offered them, and the price they paid me did not cover what they cost. Bad luck. Bad luck everywhere. Then last night, the attack. Four of my best slaves dead, three quarters of my finest merchandise stolen, and many of my donkeys killed. The gods are turned against you. Surely am I accursed. It was the spilling of the salt that brought misfortune. Why must it? Surely my offense was not premeditated. Still, the spilling of the salt is an offense against the gods and brings punishment. Oh, woe is me. Oh, Ishtar, Marduk, thou hast forsaken me. Why, have I not always been a faithful servant? Do not thy temples at Sippa shine with the splendor of the gifts that I have offered unto thee? Did I not bring the choicest Sebas from Lebanon to glorify the walls of thy dwelling places? And this is how thou dost repay me. Did I not warn you when you dropped that salt? The disaster would descend upon your house, and the anger of the gods be upon you and all your possessions? Did I not warn you? You warned me. And did I not beg you to put off this journey? Full well did I know no good could come with the gods against you. Would that I had heeded your advice. Is there no way that I can make sacrifices to the gods to regain their favor? I know of nothing you can do. There must be some way. Let us sleep. Perhaps tomorrow will bring good fortune. Yes. Maybe the gods are satisfied that enough misfortune has come to me and mine for so slight an insult. Or perhaps in slumber we will find a way of appeasing them. The gods are unfair to me. Most unfair. Ah, do not blaspheme. Good night to you. I go. Good night, Lasma. Good night. Most unfair. Marduk, Ishtar, truly you are both ungrateful gods. My whole life have I served thee well, and now for a fancied insult thou hast forsaken me. So I defy thee. See, O oh gods, even as thou hast turned thy face from me, so do I take thy sacred salt and throw it behind me. See, I defy thee. Oh, my eyes, my eyes. Who is this? Lasma, Lasma, come quickly. Well, it's pretty exciting so far. We're going to take a, a short break here, and uh, we'll be right back with more of the Golden Age Radio Theater on WDIR Windsor, Detroit, Internet Radio, local cross-border, and worldwide.